I was excited about the show. Um, I don't think I was overly excited. I was very excited that I was getting to see them because I, I had friends turn me on to Bleach, and I really love Bleach. And they had, they had seen Nirvana when they were here last time. So I was excited that I was getting to see a band, a, a band that I had just been turned on to and really liked a lot. Um, at that time, and I, I remember that the, the album was already out at that point, and I think we all knew that it was going to be really big. I mean, it just sounded like it was going to be huge. But I don't think anybody had the idea of how big it was going to be. <laughs> I'm fascinated by how Swinging London came together and how in, you know, 1967, how the UFO Club and and places like that, how, you know, how a basement beneath an Irish bar could host bands like, you know, The Move and P the Pink Floyd and um, The Pretty Things and, and some bands that went on to become pretty huge. And... You know, you talk to people who were there, and they're like, yeah, we didn't know. We just thought we were a bunch of hippies dancing around to psychedelic music and, you know, taking LSD and smoking weed. Um, uh, but to me, not having been there, I have a tendency to romanticize it. I'm like, wow, these people knew something the rest of the world didn't know, you know. And the next thing, you know, Pink Floyd's a giant band. And I think there's a tendency to look back on those Nirvana shows that way. My, my immediate memories of that, as he got into the second, third song of the set, the very first thing I thought was, oh my God, this drummer is a beast. <laughs> I'd never seen anybody play drums like that before. I mean, he was playing, one of my friends ended up getting his sticks at the end of the night, and uh, he had stick, uh, drumsticks that were like that big around, and he would play he would turn them around backwards and play with the fat ends of the sticks. And the reason I knew this is because we could see the chips in them from where he was hitting the frame of the drum snare probably, or the toms or whatever. And I'd never, I mean, other drummers could have played that way, but I'd never heard of anybody ever playing that way. And he played every single note like it was the last note he was ever gonna play. And while having the coordination to sing harmonies, which I thought was pretty blown away. I think I probably stared at him more than Kurt that night. And the band was rocking. I thought that they were tripping or something. They really did seem kind of fucked up, but I enjoyed that, how wide open they were and there was no pretense and it was just like straight on, you know? I was to the left of Dave Grohl up there, so I saw him and I saw sort of the back of Kurt. I remember that he had these pair of betas on, these sneakers that I had when I was a kid and I was all stoked because I'm like, I, I had those sneakers. And then he tore some shit up. Uh, it was great. I remember um, before the show, um, that was back when the cradle was on Main Street, uh, or not Main Street, I'm sorry, Franklin Street, um, the main drag in Chapel Hill. And up the street from that was Pepper's Pizza, which was another kind of, I guess, iconic place in Chapel Hill for a long time. And so that's kind of what you did. A lot of times you'd go to Pepper's Pizza before a show, and then you'd go to the Cat's Cradle for the show, and then cross the street to Time Out after the show. But my friend Mary and I went to Pepper's um, before the show for dinner. And I remember we were standing there in line waiting for, waiting to be seated. And I heard people come up behind me. And I looked behind me just to see who it was. And I literally did this because it was Chris from Nirvana and his wife. Um, and he just kind of looked down at me and went, and he looked, I remember thinking, he looks so tired. On both sides of the stage at the Cat's Cradle, there were then and are now bass scoops, you know, the sub. And uh, they're sort of at the corners of the stage. And for some reason, it, that wasn't the stage. Like, you know, it wasn't um, a forbidden area to be in. But for some reason, nobody ever sat on top of them, but I always did. And so... I would just kind of, you know, very politely and quietly kind of work my way to the front, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, and then I'd get up there and I'd just sort of like hop up and just kind of sit cross-legged on the bass scoop and watch whatever band. 
And man, I saw Buzzcocks that way. I saw all the great local bands like Archers of Loaf and Palvo and, you know, all those guys that way. Just from, you know, five, ten feet from the band. You know, like, they sweat on me, spill their beer on me and stuff by, by accident, you know. And Das Domin opened up, I think, too. And I was, I was friends with Lyle and those kids up, those people up north in, in uh, New Jersey. I saw them at Maxwell's a bunch. So I was already into, you know, what became grunge music. I don't think at the time there were people were even calling it anything yet. It was just, I love classic rock and I love punk rock, and it was sort of a perfect mix. There was a guy, talking about Negative Creep, I remember there was a guy that was standing right next to me that kept probably about two-thirds into the show, after in between every song, kept yelling out, you know, for them to play Negative Creep. And after a while, I was just kind of like, shut up, man. You know, like, <laughs> it was getting annoying. But they ended up playing it, which is funny because I have a bootleg of the show and you can you can hear him in the background. They're negative creep, you know. And it'd be funny because you could probably hear me like, shut up, man. Because he would scream and I'd be like, oh, you're screaming in my ear, you know. So finally, like, you know, a few songs, probably next to the last song of the night, they played it. I just remember him raising his arms up in the air ah! and like taking off towards the mosh pit. I never saw him again. He just disappeared. <laughs> and at the time... I knew the, uh, the sound man for the cradle, Caleb Southern, who was a sound man in the early 90s. And that's the reason that I got the photos that I did, is because he would let me, that back then the, the soundboard was on the, the side of the stage, the right side of the stage. And he would let me back in that area, and I could take you know, pretty much unencumbered shots from there. And so that's how I got some really good shots in Nirvana that night. Like, I also saw Pearl Jam at the Cat's Cradle, and very few people were in that crowd. It was right after they got together. And they were playing very professionally to very few people. Yeah, yeah, really sort of like, you know, erect and, you know, all the stuff that Pearl Jam does, you know, really intense and all that kind of stuff. It was a perfectly fine show. It wasn't really for me. Um, but in Nirvana, definitely had that sort of, there was a connection to the crowd. No, yeah, sure, we all got hammered. It was great. It was September, was it, or October? Do you know when it was? Of course you do. October. Yeah, yeah. October 4th. Yeah, it was fun. It was fall, autumn in Chapel Hill. It was fantastic. Everyone got hammered. Because they were hammered, and they were having fun, and that was also nice to see them. You know, nothing against shoegazers, and I love bands like the Feelies and stuff that really don't do a lot of moving around. I, I love that, but it was so good to see them up there having fun and just fucking shit up. I especially loved the replacements back then when people would throw shit at them and just tear it up. It was wide open. I remember at the end of the show, the only thing that was still standing was a cymbal. And Dave Grohl never really got out of his seat. And Kurt Cobain like, took all his drums and threw them and, and all the snares and all the cymbals. And there was one sort of high cymbal just sitting there. And Dave Grohl was just sitting there hitting that. And there was just smoke coming up from the stage from the amps and... and uh, loud feedback because he had destroyed his guitar and so he still had it plugged in so that was screeching you know and Dave Grohl's just sitting there smoke coming up everywhere and Dave Grohl's just sitting there hitting the cymbal not <laughs> like, he didn't move Kurt Cobain would run around him and grab everything and stage dive into him and Dave Grohl just kind of kept playing the drums until Kurt picked him up and threw him or whatever and he didn't move he's just sitting there hitting the cymbal and I remember leaning over my friend I said well I guess I'm not going to play an encore oh the Sliver song I like that song Sliver from the from the from the sub pop singles, uh, well, again, I'm sure it's been talked about at nauseum, but I love the Pixies, you know. So like, it was right in the wheelhouse of that kind of start, stop, and loud, loud, fast, loud, soft, loud, soft. You know, it was really good, and also reminded me of a story of my own grandma when I was a young person and passing out. Well, I guess you don't pass out when you're a child; you probably fall asleep because you're exhausted, <laughs> and uh, and waking up in my father's arms and like, you know. Kurt Cobain, I don't think they even said anything, but Kurt Cobain came off stage and he almost knocked down my friend Graham, who was standing there by the door, and he just literally, he took off running around the side to the band door. I, mean, I have this image in my head, etched forever in my head, of this. <laughs> because he just, he did... And I was thinking he did not want to be there. He just wanted to get this over with. Nirvana? I mean, if you told me that, like, you know, 40-year-old dudes are going to be driving around in their BMWs rocking that record, 
or that it was going to be blasting from every frat house in town, um, or, you know, that Letterman was going to be talking about them, or they would be on the news or something. And, I mean, considering this is all pre-internet, you know, it's, it's particularly hard to fathom. But if you told me that they were going to rise to that level of success, I, I never would have believed it. No. So, so, yes, I left that show, to answer your question, I left that show thinking, man, yeah, these guys are definitely on the way. But, I mean, who could have had any idea? But I didn't think, like, I just witnessed this incredible moment of history that we'd be sitting here talking about all these years later. You know, um, I thought it was a great show, and they were awesome. But I, you never think that it's something that would leave a mark like that, which is interesting because you talk to anybody who was there or anybody who was around at that time or even the Cat's Cradle owner himself, they probably still, everyone sort of universally agrees, that's probably the most memorable show ever there. Um, not as much because of the performance, not to take anything away from the performance because it was one of the best shows I've ever seen. But just because of it, what ended up happening shortly after that, you know, and just everything, just how we just were lucky to be there at this moment in time and see this this little moment in time, this little nugget of time, was was really interesting. I'm very glad that I was there. Chapel Hill has kind of gotten the spotlight for being known as a music city, and but it's very small, and I've always thought that that was that was very interesting. But I think there is there is the the feeling here that the, that it is a it is a music city, and that's one of the things that's kept me here for as long as I've been here. It's just the the fact that I have access to great shows, and you know, in the early '90s, um, that was there. There was no end of really great shows that came through that you could see for cheap. And, you know, it's still kind of that way. I mean, um, the Cat's Cradle has such a great reputation, you know, for being a good club. I and mean, there's, there's bands that will play in the United States and maybe do six gigs, and one of them will be Chapel Hill. You know, it'll be like New York, Seattle, L.A., Chapel Hill. So I know that Chapel Hill has that. I look at this very impressive... Uh acrobatic move that Kurt's doing on the back. This is a typical Charles Peterson shot. You know, you know, with, with, it's like being at the show. That guy pretty much put Seattle on the map. Um, so yeah, and then I guess I got this within a day or two of it coming out. And this is, uh, this is the first issue. This would have been one of the first 250,000, which doesn't make it seem rare to me, one of 250,000. But this doesn't have the um, the bonus track that's hidden after something in the way, and so I remember like when people bought it later on and they had that extra song. I was a little pissed off that I didn't have the the extra track. Shit, maybe. I think that there have been bands as good as Nirvana since then, but maybe not at the right place at the right time. You know what I'm saying? But uh, who knows? It's a shame that he died. I think that that's really the bottom line. I, what I do recall was just how um, sheltered Kurt, they were tr the people around him were trying to shelter him because there was just so much coming at him all of a sudden, and probably other guys in the band too. But you know, everyone was concerned about Kurt and how he how that affected him and um, so I didn't you know I didn't meet him or talk to him or anything like that because I didn't want to contribute to the, the concerns and uh, and the show was you know it was a legendary show um, it was sort of right at the the height or the birth of the whole <clears throat> moshing and stage diving and during sort of more normal rock shows as opposed to hardcore shows and that kind of thing and there was it was pretty active and um but yeah i mean it's definitely a legendary show uh and everyone they went to it remembers it quite fondly and it's too bad we never were able to get them back but yeah to 
the ride didn't last very long, so that's the way it goes.